Hello everybody and welcome to another educational video brought to you by ActGeo. Um, we've done some videos with some lecture materials, we've done some videos on the rocks, I hopefully you enjoy those. What I thought we'd do now is a few videos where we take some of our models from our outcrop and, and discuss them in more detail uh, with some materials and slides as well. So hopefully you'll enjoy this, this format. And what we'll do today is we'll go and look at an outcrop. We'll talk a little bit about where this outcrop is, but what we're going to try to do is figure out its depositional setting, and particularly whether this is a, a shallow water or a deep water depositional setting. Now, figuring out a depositional setting of an outcrop or a core or a, a region that you're working is really usually best done by regional context. So looking at all the observations around you, uh, understanding the basin architecture, that's, that's really what helps you figure out your depositional setting. Um, another aspect, of course, is bias stratigraphy. I'm looking at both micro and macro fossil assemblages. Uh, can tell you a lot about water depth and general uh, depositional conditions. But when these things are either absent or uh, ambiguous, we can always go back to good old-fashioned uh, sedimentology and stratigraphy and just describe the rocks, look at their sedimentary structures, the facies types, and their stacking patterns. And we can use that usually to at least kind of narrow down the options of the depositional setting. So let's have a look at this. So one of the things about shallow water and deep water depositional settings is that in a lot of textbooks and a lot of teaching materials, we tend to break out um, marine classic depositional systems by either being shallow water or deep water. And like so many things in geology, the actual definition of that is not always clear and can be quite variable. So what makes something a shallow water versus a deep water setting? Well, obviously you'll have to kind of make your definitions and make sure that those definitions are understood with the people that you work with. But obviously, shallow water versus deep water, that's a, that's a water depth thing, isn't it? So maybe it's something to do with uh, your definition of storm wave base. Maybe you use water depth in the, in the classical definition on, on continental slopes as the neuritic, baffial, and abyssal parts of a, a depositional profile. Now, very often, we tend to use particularly deep water um, synonymous almost with the dominant depositional process being sediment gravity flow deposits. So very often we'll talk about deep water as things that are dominated by um, turbidites and debrites and things like that. Now that is really not a water depth thing. We can get that across a whole range of water depth. So just be careful with that. Another thing that you'll sometimes see is uh, an, uh, you know, a reference to whether something is attached to a shoreline or not. And that often in paralic depositional settings, uh, the movement of the shoreline really influences a lot of the depositional motifs. So very often you'll see, as I said in textbooks, sort of a, a separation by kind of paralic depositional settings, um, different types of shorelines and different types of sediment supply associated with those shorelines. And there are a lot of really good um, reference diagrams, such as the one shown below here, that you can use to articulate different um, sub-styles of depositional settings in these uh, paralic shallow water settings. And likewise, there are lots of really good depositional cartoons available that allow you to articulate different styles of settings in what's generally called deep water settings or things dominated by sediment gravity flow deposits. These diagrams are really useful, um, but you should always think of modifying these to best suit your, your local data as much as you can. And obviously with, with things like this, they, they kind of are very specific and you can even see in the little cartoon above here that there's an area where these things are not really linked in a single depositional profile. So very often, particularly in these settings where we're away from the coarse classic supply associated with shorelines, but we're not quite in a deep water setting, we often struggle with identifying what kind of depositional setting this is. So let's go and look at an outcrop. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at an outcrop on the far northeast side of Scotland. Um, in the Upper Jurassic, so this is Upper Jurassic Age marine stratigraphy at the outcrop. And this, at that point, forms the, the margin of the, the North Sea Rift Basin. So in the Upper Jurassic, the North Sea Rift was taking place, forming a whole set of, of graben systems illustrated here. And our outcrop sits right on the margin of this tectonically induced um, graben and is associated with the, the arm of the graben, which is called the, the Moray Firth Basin. So let's go and have a look at that um, in a little bit more detail. 
I'll zoom in on where we're going to go here. So we're going to zoom in to this location here um, at Crackay Beach, which is a, a beach here um, where you can see a, a little river that comes and meets the sea. And the outcrop we'll look at is located along the intersection between this, this railway line that runs here and the, uh, the river over here. So just to kind of set the, the really broad geological scene here, this is the location of our outcrop, and it's along a coastal area that is dominated by Upper Jurassic marine sands and muds. Up dip of that, there are some Devonian terrestrial sandstones, and then through a, a norm, network of normal faults that bound the edge of this basin, we are uh, down thrown to some uplifted areas that have, in this case, we'll just generically call that basement. There's some granitic metamorphic terrains out in here. So back in the upper Jurassic, this was the fault bounded margin of the basin. So a very steep basin from um, very shallow water settings uh, on the footballs here to fairly deep water settings as you come off these, 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 uh, these faults with several hundreds meters of displacement on them. So our, our outcrop is located in that transition from a shallow water to a, a deep water setting. So let's go and have a look at that model. So as we zoom in here, you will be able to see that um, over here is the area of our model. You can see colored here by, by the digital elevation model, uh, the intersection between the, the railway bridge and the river. And there's a, a, um, a southern segment and a northern segment associated with that outcrop. So let's pull up the, uh, the 3D model here. So you can see in the 3D model here the, uh, the captured part of the, uh, of the railway bridge here and uh, the left hand side or the more northerly side and the, the, uh, the right hand side here which is the, uh, the more southerly side of the, of the outcrop. Everything is dipping here towards the left so the oldest stratigraphy is on the right hand side of the railway bridge so let's go and have a look at that in a little bit more detail. So you can see there's some interbedded nature to it. There's some resistant um, gray and buff colored beds in here. And then there's some fairly laminated looking recessive units um, in between here. Um, fairly punctuated by the looks of it, at least from a distance. One of the things that you can see getting put in here are some of these um, inclined surfaces in here. And those are faults, normal faults. So what you can see about these normal faults is that they, they don't continue very far. So they, they abruptly end. So these are um, syn, syn, syn depositional normal faults that are showing a, a, a syn depositional um, deformation that is occurring in this outcrop. In addition to that, there are some other dipping surfaces in here, uh, particularly in the sand bed in here, as you can see. Uh, and those are actually um, bedding planes uh, forming fairly large scale cross stratification in here. So some of these sands, a lot of them are fairly homogeneous and we'll talk a little bit about what it is, but we can still in places see some fairly low angle dipping surfaces that are illust illustrative of some um, bed forms being made here by uh, fairly large scale um, dunes formed by traction in this case. So those are some of the sands, fairly sharp base and sharp top with some of these inclined surfaces in here. Now let's go and have a look at some of the, uh, the recessive unit in here as well. And this recessive unit is quite interesting when you start looking into it a little bit more uh, closely and we'll zoom in a little bit because you can clearly see that not everything is uniformly dipping. There's actually some areas that are fairly steeply dipping in here um, to the left and then there's actually a block here that is dipping in an opposing direction and there's actually some uh, some folding that can be seen in here as well. So this is actually an interval that contains some blocks that have been rotated and translated as well as folded. And here's one of these blocks of this interbedded sand and mud where the sand is lighter colored and the mud is darker colored being translated in here. So this is basically a, a unit with some um, Syn depositional deformation going on, both some folding, uh, some blocks being rotated in here. So this is basically a, a very small little mass transport uh, deposit composed of, of slumped and slided materials. The material is very much the fin bedded material that we see um, undisturbed around here as well. So moving in on the sands again, um, they have these quite peculiar roundish shapes in here. And when we go and look at it in detail, a lot of these are actually fluidization fabrics. So there is a very rapid fluid escape from these sands, creating these, these kind of 
vertical uh, features in there that, that create this sort of uh, bulbous pattern of the sands. Again, indicative of very rapid deposition of the sand and rapid loading of the sands. And again, zooming in on the, the fine grains, uh, quite picturesque. Uh, you see a lot of the small scale syn depositional faulting in there, very nicely articulated uh, with this fin bedded material. And the quality here is still good enough to even see some um, flame and load structures in there as well. So really quite a high resolution model. So a lot of evidence of a lot of um, syn depositional um, fluid escape and deformation here indicating very rapid sedimentation. As we go to the, uh, the left-hand side of the outcrop, the younger rock, um, there is still a, a quite impressive sand body in here, but that is entirely um, rotated and slumped in. So it sits within a quite fixed succession of slump deposits. And you can see indications here of a few other surfaces that are just coming into the model here now of boundaries where you see uh, truncation and onlap of satigraphy. So this is the base of a of again a little mass transport deposit and overall this whole section here is much finer grain there's still a lot of fin bedded sands in there but overall much more finer grain as we go up compared to the right so that's that's the model um, an outcrop about 100 meters wide and about 25 meters of stratigraphy represented uh, in this really quite classical outcrop of upper jurassic um, interbedded sands and muds that are marine deposits so that is the model. Now, what do we make of this? So let's just zoom in a little bit on the, um, the right hand side, the older part of the, the stratigraphy on the right hand side of the railway bridge and make some observations. We measured a section a uh, long time ago, actually, of my friend Davide Durante. So you can see the, the measured section here on the left, illustrating uh, some of the observations we made. We see at the base, mostly medium to fine grain sands, uh, not typically graded, uh, convolute tops, erosional bases, and large scale cross beds. And as we go up, uh, those sands tend to get a little thinner, finer grained, and they are heavily fluidized. So they have these, these fluidization fabrics and irregular tops associated with them. Um, the, the recessive units in here are really composed of quite clay-rich uh, mud with interbedded current rippled sands and in places, as indicated here, with the, uh, the purple color, some of these units are, are heavily uh, deformed and these are basically small mass transport deposits, slumps and slides interbedded in here. So we see a lot of evidence of syn depositional faulting, um, folding, deformation, so things are being deposited here on some kind of slope that is fairly unstable. So that's kind of what it looks like once you're all done with it. So what kind of depositional setting is this? That's the, uh, well, maybe not million dollar question, but there's always a lot of discussion to be at here because you can put this in a few different spots. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, again, this is a really nice cartoon uh, in the fourth edition of the Geology of Scotland that, that summarizes the, the broad depositional setting in the upper Jurassic based on a number of outcrops and also um, the lack of outcrops, but evidence of uh, shallow water carbonate deposits through some of the debris flows that are containing a lot of coral fragments and bivalves and things like that. But we have a, a, a delta being built out and then in a, in a relay ramp, we see a, a deep water um, channel to fan deposit being, being deposited in here. And where our outcrop is located is really right in that area where I go from what traditionally would be called shallow water, a, a delta deposit, to a deep water um, slope to basin setting. So in here, because this is a, such a narrow margin, um, there's probably a couple of ways we can interpret this outcrop. Um, you know, one thing that we can interpret is this is basically this is a pro delta. So this fin bedded sand and mud with all the soft sediment deformation is quite indicative of a slope. So that's basically the clinoform slope of the pro delta. And the fact that I have these thick amalgamated sands in there that are fluidized, those are just storm deposits that are coming off the, uh, the delta front at times, um, either flood discharge or other kind of monsoonal um, storms that give me these, these quite thick bedded sands in there. So that would be one model that will put you in sort of a pro delta setting with embedded storm deposits. Now, the other model you can throw at this is, well, we know that we have a deep water fan that's being fed into the basin. So that is probably building a, a confined system in the updip portions. And a lot, lot of the time that confinement is built by levees. Levees are also thin bedded sands and muds, lots of soft sediment deformation. 
And then the fig bedded sands in that case would be um, basically the overflow of the suspension load of a big flow that is the fine and medium sand being spilled over on top of the levee, basically making splay deposits while the coarser grade material is transported into the basin. So the second option is basically a proximal levee with overflow splay deposits. So we're maybe a little bit further down dip and offset laterally to a some kind of a canyon that is transporting sand to the basin. So why do you care? Well, you know, if you're thinking about reservoir systems, obviously, if this is something you've drilled, sort of, eh, okay, some net to grow, some sands, but they're not amalgamated. Which way do you go to find better sands? Obviously, the, the levee splay model would be um, a more interesting, attractive kind of proposition because it means that at least in the early stages of the levee buildup, a, a lot of the coarser grain sand is being transported into the basin, maybe making some coarser um, kind of channel lobe transition deposits. And then as the levee gets high enough, even the fine and medium sand may not make it over the levee anymore, and it can actually build a quite substantial uh, deep water fan deposit. So those are probably a couple of good options for what this outcrop represents in terms of that, that transition between shallow water and deep water settings. So hopefully that was uh, a useful little video looking at some rocks um, through the model and thinking a little bit about um, interpreting purely based on sedimentological observations, lithophases, and stacking patterns, particularly stacking patterns, the, the, the finding up of uh, this succession and thinning up of sands is probably the one thing that makes me lean a little bit more towards the levee model than the, than the pro delta model. But hey, if you want to come and hang out with us uh, and look at this outcrop and many, many more uh, models in great detail, um, this is part of a course that we teach in the classroom or even better in the field, you can come up to the northeast of Scotland and, and look at these outcrops and take some of our subsurface data from the basin out as well. So it's a really, it's a really cool place to go and look at outcrop and subsurface data within a single uh, genetic basin setting. So please let me know if you like this video. Um, any comments are always appreciated. And if you want to engage with us more, you can always drop us a line through our websites or uh, our LinkedIn page. See you on the next one.